Good afternoon. Let me first start by saying again and always that we're praying for all the victims of the Key Bridge collapse and also their loved ones. We continue to pray for you, and we always will. Continuamos orando por ustedes y los seguiremos haciendo. I also want to thank, again and always, our remarkable first responders and all of our emergency personnel who have been working around the clock in advance of everything today and take care and leading on our response. And I want to thank everyone who has been part of the response from the private sector to the public sector, to the armed forces, to philanthropy, to all parts of society, and all of those who have offered prayers from all over the world. I want to let you know that your prayers have been felt. All who have offered kind words, I want to say that your kind words have been heard. And also, I want to thank Trade Point Atlantic. This horrific human tragedy was also an economic catastrophe. In the early hours, it was Trade Point who said, let us help. The Port of Baltimore is one of the busiest ports in the world, and the collapse of the Key Bridge has shut down vessel traffic to the port. Trade Point Atlantic immediately began mobilizing and accepting some cargo ships from vessels that were bound from the Port of Baltimore, immediately began preparing for those arrivals, and they accepted their first shipment of cargo bound for the port just yesterday. We will continue working closely with their team, and we are grateful for their support and grateful for their leadership. Now, today, I will provide updates on the four directives I've issued to our team. As a reminder, the directives are, first, we need to continue to focus on recovery because we have to bring a sense of closure to these families. Second, we need to be clear, we need to clear the channel and open the vessel traffic to the port because the health of the Maryland economy and the national economy depend on it. Third, we need to take care of all the people who have been affected by this crisis. That means the families, that means the workers, that means the businesses, that means the first responders, that means everybody. And fourth, we need to and we will rebuild the key bridge. So first, on our recovery efforts. As I mentioned yesterday, we need to do more work clearing the channel to move forward. This is a remarkably complex operation, and our focus needs to be on unity of command and unity of effort. Every morning, we have a unified command briefing, which includes state police, the U.S. Coast Guard, the Army Corps of Engineers, our federal delegation, and other leaders who are central to this mission. Now, during that briefing, Colonel Butler, the superintendent of the Maryland State Police, discussed that the conditions in the water makes it unsafe for divers. But as soon as those conditions change, his divers will go back in the water. Second, on clearing the federal channel and opening vessel traffic to the port. As of this morning, I've been briefed by the Maryland Department of Transportation on clearing wreckage and moving forward. Our team went out with the Coast Guard just a few hours ago, including the, the Coast Guard Commandant, to survey the damage, to see the wreckage up close, to see a freight that is nearly the size of the Eiffel Tower, and to see that same freight with the key bridge resting on top of it, to see shipping containers that were ripped in half as if they were paper mache, to know that out there you have to navigate high winds and electric wires, to go out there and to see it up close, you realize just how daunting a task this is. You realize how difficult the work is ahead of us. With a salvage operation this complex and frankly, with a salvage operation this unprecedented, 
You need to plan for every single moment, and every time you take action to move a piece of wreckage, you understand that that requires you to reassess the situation. So when I led soldiers in combat, I knew that preparation was everything. You do not go into the field of battle without getting the intelligence that you need first. So as the mission continues, you need to stay frosty, you need to reassess, and you need to adapt. That's the mindset the Army Corps is applying with their partners in Unified Command. We have the best inspectors, the best surveyors, and the best engineers in the world working and setting up and executing a plan of action right here in Maryland. And I've been informed by the U.S. Navy that they are supplying us with four heavy lift cranes. Two have already arrived, one arrives tonight, and the fourth is arriving on Monday. One of the cranes is called the Chesapeake 1000, and it can lift about 1,000 tons. But the big part, and one of the challenges, is that the key bridge, which sits on top of the vessel right now, that that weight is somewhere between three and 4,000 tons. So our team needs to cut that truss into sections in a safe, in a responsible, and in an efficient way before it can lift those pieces out of the water. This crane that we're looking at is massive. The thing we also know is this. So is the challenge ahead of us. So in the coming weeks, we expect to have the following, the following entities inside of the water. Seven floating cranes, 10 tugs, nine barges, eight salvage vessels, and five Coast Guard boats. I've said it before, I will say it again, and I will keep on saying it. This is not just about Maryland. This mission is not just about Maryland. And what we're talking about today is not just about Maryland's economy. This is about the nation's economy. The port handles more cars and more farm equipment than any other port in this country. At least 8,000 workers on the docks have jobs that have been directly impacted by this collapse. Our economy depends on the port of Baltimore and the port of Baltimore depends on vessel traffic. Maryland's economy and Maryland's workers rely on us to move quickly. But that's not just Maryland. The nation's economy and the nation's workers are requiring us to move quickly. Third, on taking care of our people. I want to talk a little bit about the work that we're doing with the Maryland legislature. I want to thank Speaker Adrian Jones, Senate President Bill Ferguson, and Minority Leader Steve Hershey. They have been in touch with our team since day one. I also want to thank Delegate Luke Klippinger, Senator Johnny Ray Sailing, and other members of the District 6 and District 46 teams. And I want to thank all of the Maryland legislators who have reached out and offered their support. Legislators, frankly, on both sides of the aisle. And I want to thank our federal delegation, too, to include Jamie Raskin, who was here earlier, but, uh, but unfortunately not be here now. But to the members of the Maryland General Assembly, we know this. We are 10 days away from the conclusion of this legislative session, and there is a lot of work to do. The top priority in that work is going to be finalizing our budget. My administration proposed a responsible budget that makes important investments in housing and childcare and environmental protection and transportation. So now it is vital that the House and the Senate find compromise as soon as possible, pass the budget, and provide certainty at this challenging an uncertain time. We also need to ensure that we pass legislation to support the families and the victims of the bridge collapse and everyone else who has been affected by this emergency. I'll be proposing the creation of a permanent state scholarship 
for the children of surviving spouses of transportation workers who lost their lives on this job. We will continue to push for legislation that seeks to protect workers like the six victims of the Key Bridge collapse. I've also asked the General Assembly to ensure that any legislation we work on provides the flexibility our administration needs to support port workers, businesses, and our transportation network. We cannot possibly find every answer to every problem in the next few days before session ends, but we can give the state the ability to respond over the coming months. Fourth, on rebuilding. As I said yesterday, we cannot rebuild the bridge until we have cleared the wreckage. I've always believed that you never learn anything about anybody when times are easy. If you really want to understand someone's mettle, watch them when it's hard. Watch them when it's difficult. Watch them when the stakes are high. Well, that time is now, and we are going to rise to meet this moment because we are Maryland tough and because we are Baltimore strong. So in this moment, I'm gonna hand it off to the US Coast Guard over to Admiral Gilreath. And then after that, we'll be briefed by Colonel Pinkachin from the, uh, uh, P Pinchasen from the Army Corps of Engineers, the Maryland State Police, the Maryland Department of Transportation, EPA Administrator Ortiz, Congressman, Congressman Kwasi Fume, and County Executive Johnny Olszewski. Alan Gilbert. Thank you, Governor. Thanks, sir. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon. I'm Rear Admiral Shannon Gilreath speaking on behalf of the Unified Command. As I mentioned last night, our number one priority of the Unified Command is to reopen the Port of Baltimore. And to do that, we've broken that into three phases. Number one phase is reopen the shipping channel. Number two is remove the ship. And number three is to remove the debris from the bridge from the rest of the waterway. We are beginning to make progress on those phases. In the phase one, we talked about that we need to do the assessments of the bridge, both above the waterline and beneath the water. Those assessments continue as the governor said, we were out there today and we could see the engineers and the divers and the survey boats out there on the water in these difficult wind conditions, doing their job, doing their work to assess that bridge, to figure out how we can cut it up into the pieces we need to be able to lift. And back at the Unified Command, the governor, the commandant, all the elected officials, they could see those engineers working on those very plans. Engineers from the Army Corps of Engineers, Navy Supervisor of Salvage. We had state engineers there. There were some private engineers helping us and we had some Coast Guard engineers there. And they're all working diligently to figure out that right plan to be able to break that bridge up into the right size pieces that we can lift. And the second part of that is we need to get the heavy lift equipment here. And we've been telling you that those cranes are on their way and that equipment's on that way. And behind us, you can see the first of those things that are arriving. They're arriving and they're gonna to continue to arrive for the next several days. And we're gonna continue that planning so that we will be ready to be able to take advantage of that as soon as possible and do it safely. I'll turn it over to Colonel Pinchason. Governor Moore, elected officials, thank you so much for having us here. Uh, as we just transition to the most critical mission that we have to open and restore the channel, to clear the shipping channel and open the Port of Baltimore, we've now begun surveying and conducting engineer analysis and assessing in order for us to conduct the integrated salvage operations within the channel and also to refloat the vessel as well as <clears throat> remove the wreckage of the bridge. 
However, the top priority for all the equipment that we're marshalling right here is going to be focused on clearing the channel. Now that doesn't happen overnight, and the work that our team is doing is just phenomenal. I can't say enough about the team that we've assembled here. Kind of had a little bit of a dress rehearsal when we did the Ever Forward, and that's the same team that we have on the ground. That industry muscle memory, that incredible wealth of knowledge, expertise, skills, experience, all those lessons are being applied here, and it's a really powerful partnership. I can't say enough about what those folks are doing. We should all be super proud to see state, federal partners, DOD partners coming together. It should give the Baltimore, the Port of Baltimore, the people of Baltimore, the state of Maryland, and our nation so much confidence to know that they have the right people here to execute this mission. We're going to be doing that safely and as quickly as possible. So with that, sir, I'll turn it over. Thanks, John. Good afternoon. I'm Colonel Roland Butler, Secretary of the Maryland Department of State Police. Uh, to build on what Colonel Pinchason just told you, there's an incredible synergy going on within the Unified Command with everyone working together, working hard towards a common goal. You heard the governor's objectives. We're working hard to accomplish those objectives. The MSP has a team of divers on standby waiting for the first word that it is safe and it is clear to go in and examine what's beneath the wreckage and recover any of these individuals that perished in this unfortunate incident. In addition to that, the MSP Aviation Command is providing aerial support to all the parties involved, be it surveying, photographs, whatever. We are all looking forward to doing whatever we can to help this come to a conclusion. The Aviation Command has also reached out to the FAA to establish a tactical flight restriction area. That area begins three miles, nautical miles, in every direction from the center span of the bridge and goes up 1,500 feet. We cannot impress upon the public enough. Please stay away from that area with drones or any other type of equipment like that. If there are any violations of that airspace, law enforcement remains poised, fe federal, state, and local partners, to act upon any of those violations, locate those individuals, and bring them to justice. The most important thing is that you exercise patience, understanding, compassion for the people lost in this, and allow the workers to do their job safely and effectively. Thank you. Good afternoon, Paul Wiedefeld, Secretary of Transportation. Uh, thanks to the $60 million that approved yesterday by the Federal Highway Administration, the department is working closely with the Coast Guard and the Corps of Engineers on salvage operations. In fact, a team is currently out, out at the site in doing a survey so that we can begin this, this salvage work. As the governor mentioned, additional support and resources will be arriving over the weekend. Our focus continues in to be in three areas, the impacts of traffic on our communities and moving traffic throughout the region, addressing the economic impacts to the Port of Baltimore, and work with our federal partners to rebuild the Francis Scott Key Bridge. In terms of traffic, our <coughs> department's dedicated team is working on a number of traffic issues. The State Highway Administration and the Maryland Transit Authority have deployed additional traffic resources throughout the region. This includes the deployment of additional emergency response vehicles so quickly to quickly assist motorists in need of assistance in clear crashes. We're also looking at making any changes to the system to help improve the traffic flow, such as making adjustments to the timing of traffic signals. In addition, we are looking at all the ongoing work, work projects we have along the, uh, along the region and any detours we may need to do uh, to support traffic, smooth traffic. Our efforts uh, in, include coordinating with our partners in the trucking community to inform them about alternative routes. I'm pleased to say that our transportation system is working well in fact, there's been a 10% increase in daily ridership on the Maryland Transit Administration's core east bus service. In terms of, bus, in terms of port operation, <clears throat> then our support for the workers, as I mentioned last night, we are just concluding a, a meeting that we had with the poor community, businesses, and labor to see what assistance we can provide them. I'd like to thank the Department of Labor and the Department of Commerce for being part of this as we move forward. In terms of building the bridge, as a, <coughs> our team is actively working on that front as well. 
we are considering innovative design, engineering, and building methods so that we can quickly deliver this project. In closing, I appreciate everyone's uh, uh, continued patience as we deal with the, with the significant impacts this may have. And also, please drive safely and respect the speed limits around all of our workers. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Adam Ortiz. I'm the administrator for EPA's Mid-Atlantic Region. Governor, thank you for convening us here today. And it's great to be up here with our co-regulators at the Maryland Department of the Environment, as well as members of our federal family. First, our thoughts and prayers are with the families who are feeling the impacts of this tragedy. Saludos a todos, especialmente a las familias se afectan. I want to thank our EPA response team, our water division and emergency response team for the work that you are doing in support of the U.S. Coast Guard in response to this terrible tragedy. We have been here since day one. And today we have Laura Castillas, who's our on-scene coordinator, who is in coordination and part of the Unified Command. I want to provide a little bit of background on the structure of the response and EPA's participation and how we're looking out together for environmental protection. Per the Federal National Contingency Plan, which oversees and guides on how environmental responses are carried out, the Coast Guard, in this case, is the lead agency for, it, for incidents related to potential and actual spills or discharges in navigable waterways. This means that the Coast Guard, under the Admiral's leadership, oversees the priorities, operations, and strategies in the protection of human health and the environment of that response. EPA, as many of you know, is known as a regulatory agency, and that's an important role that we have, but we're much more than that. We're also a partner. EPA has been here, as I said, since day one, providing support and guidance to the Coast Guard and all the other partners. We play a key role in supporting and leading responses and cleanups involving of oil into waterways as well as inland areas. And we've been doing it for decades, thousands and thousands of incidents. We've been on the ground working with local leaders, state governments, and our sister agencies at the federal level. In this response, EPA's role is that of an advisor. We're here to use science and our experience to carry forth the U.S. Coast Guard and the Maryland Department of, en of Environment Unified Command's objectives for managing this event. In our various roles here, EPA evaluates information provided by the Coast Guard on dangerous goods on the vessel and provides recommendations on developing plans and strategies as needed. At this time, there is no indication of active releases from the vessel, nor of the presence of materials that are hazardous to human health in the water. However, monitoring is ongoing, and we will work through the unified command to report and review and be transparent of any results from this monitoring as they become available. I will defer to the admiral, who's captain of this ship, for, for, for more details. Most importantly, as the governor said, the Unified Command will evolve and adapt as necessary, and we are on the team. The work that we do together helps heal the land and our waters, the economy and our social fabric. And we never, ever do anything alone on team environment. So thank you to everybody here in whatever capacity you have. It matters, and we're honored to be on the field with you. Kwaisi Mfume, member of Congress, 7th District of Maryland. Um, my thanks to all of you, particularly who are here in the press. I know you don't hear it often enough, but thanks for telling this story. It is an American story that so many people are depending on you to convey to them. As I thanked the governor yesterday, I want to thank him again for making this such a very open and transparent progress, process so that people understand what's going on here and that it's more than we can even comprehend sometimes. Now, Senator Ben Cardin and Senator Chris Van Hollen were with us most of the day. They've both been called away on official duties, and Congressman Jamie Raskin from the western side of the state left just a few moments ago. But they are, and we are together, the team that's working in a bipartisan way here in Maryland. All of us, all members of the House and both members of the Senate, 
find a way to get the resources in that the governor so desperately needs and that all of us need, quite frankly, to be able to accomplish the three priorities that the Rear Admiral laid out to us. We had a great briefing this morning with the Commandant of the Coast Guard. I want to thank the Coast Guard in particular, as well as the Army Corps of Engineers, for doing what they have done. They are really running a unified command. And when you look over our shoulders at the bridge and what's left of it, you'll understand why this city, this state, and indeed our nation cries at this moment, because we can never replace what was there, and we mourn the people who were lost there, and that will forever be a reminder to all of us. Now, I want to just say to the 8,000 dock workers out there, we know you're there. We're going to find a way to get you back to work, and we want to find a way also to increase the ability for people to realize that this affects supply chains all over the country. As the governor said, it is happening here, but it is an American story. I spoke just a little while ago with the administrator of the SBA so that we can start expediting a way to help small businesses who rely on import-export items to be able to survive. And I just want to thank, as everybody has, all of those many people who are nameless and faceless who have given so much to this effort now and going forward. Thank you, Governor, for the opportunity to be here, and your congressional delegation is on it. I've spoken twice today with Speaker Johnson's office. We've been missing each other, but I'd have to say that he has, an, a, in my opinion, a real desire to want to try to assist in any way that we can. So thank you all for being here again. I'm going to yield back to the governor, I guess, at this point, and all you. Uh, good afternoon, Baltimore County Executive Johnny Olszewski. Uh, again, I want to thank Governor Moore and his incredible team uh, for their efforts in partnership. I want to thank and acknowledge uh, Mayor Brandon Scott and County Executive Stuart Pittman, who have been uh, local colleagues and partners in this work. Uh, and I also want to thank our federal partners, especially the U.S. Coast Guard and the Army Corps of Engineers, as we plan to reopen our shipping lanes and to rebuild the Key Bridge. I also want to thank the President and Secretary Buttigieg for their tremendous outpouring of support in our time of need in the greater Baltimore area. And today, I especially want to thank our partners here at Trade Point Atlantic, especially Carrie, Mark, and Aaron. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, this is home to me, uh, as it is for so many others. And as I read this morning, residents have said the key bridge is us. And for those of us who grew up in the shadow of that bridge, it has truly been a lifetime of connection. Those of us here at home, we mourn the loss of our neighbors, the workers on the bridge. We worry about the future of other neighbors who work at the Port of Baltimore and beyond. And we're even grieving the loss of the structure itself, a strange emptiness in the sky that's hard to explain to people who aren't from here. But we are a town that literally was built on steel at this site, and coming together and persevering is what we do. We are a community that honors our first responders. We are a community that rallies around our impacted neighbors. This tragedy will not define us, and the wreckage will not divide us. I think it's fitting that over 200 years ago, the anthem of our country was written where the structure of the bridge once stood. And in that moment in our nation's history, we were being bombarded day and night relentlessly. And in this moment, it feels like we're being bombarded relentlessly day and night. But with the partners we have here, just then as now, we are coming together in the same way that in recent years we came together at this site as we lost and said goodbye to our steel plant. But we were able to transform this site through ingenuity, partnership, and the kinds of collaboration we're seeing now. 
We know this will take time, as the governor has said, but we will also be bold in insisting that we work as quickly as possible and also as safely as possible. Because it is who we are and because the stakes are beyond just Baltimore, it's beyond just Maryland, as Governor Moore said, this has global implications. So we stand ready to continue working with you, Governor. Uh, we thank our partners again, and we look forward to showing that steel resolve as we've always do. Thank you. I'm sorry. Um, uh, I, I, I can't uh, say what, what, uh, what was done after 9-11. Uh, uh, I know that, that the evaluation of all of our critical infrastructure is something that has been consistent and thorough and ongoing. Um, so I can't speak to exactly what happened after 9-11, but we know that the, that the infrastructure protection is something that has been a priority. It's something that will continue to be a priority. And as the investigation continues to uh, uh, continues to endure about what happened specifically with this incident, that uh, that we will that we will uh, continue to make sure that uh, we are keeping the people of our state safe. Okay, Brad Bell, Governor, it's the same question. Do you have any feel now for a time frame? Again, I know you want to, you know, under promise, over deliver, but I mean, do you have any feel for a time? Can you get in there, chip in and out? No, listen, and and, and trust me, Brad. I, I I I really appreciate the question. Um, you know, I, when we went out there today to go take a look at the, at the wreckage and we got a chance to get up close to this massive vessel that had two to 3,000 tons of steel sitting on it, going in a place where the key bridge once proudly was erected and to be able to go under where it was and look up and see the blue sky and not see the bridge. It, um, it underscored the long road that we have ahead of us. The, so I can't say right now if this is going to be, if this, how, what's the time period? I can tell you it is not going to be days or weeks or months. This is going to take time. Every single phase we have to focus on safety of the people who are doing the work we have to make sure that we're doing it in cooperation and collaboration with all the parties that are going to need to be involved inside this work. We have to make sure that we're doing it in an environmentally sound way. And we have to make sure we're focusing on completion. So I can tell you, I am, uh, we are focusing on moving speedily and getting it done quickly. I want this done quickly. I want it done right. We are committed to getting it done and you can bet on it. We are going to get this done. but. This is going to be a long road. So I, I can, uh, so why don't I bring up Colonel Pinchasen if you want to speak to any explosives. So <clears throat> as I mentioned, right now we're in the stage of assessing it. It's, uh, it's still too early, especially for the time. It's entirely too early to, to give you a schedule and also to determine whether or not we're going to use that, that option. There are so many assets that are being brought and marshaled here. And the work that's happening now, I know you're looking at all this equipment that's sitting here, but you have to know that behind the scenes, what was described as the engineering analysis that's taking place, the divers in the water, all the survey work that's going on, all this information that has to be compiled to make sure we get the engineering right so that every lift that's happening is happening correctly. And it's going to be this iterative process of lifting and reassessing, making sure that it's stable, making sure that what we're going to send folks down to observe and confirm is safe for them to handle. And then we're going to take it very methodically 
and that's going to allow us to go faster. By doing, by investing this time now in the engineering, we're going to be able to move faster later. And I know right now everyone wants to see things moving. You need to know, you need to trust that behind the scenes it's moving. And that speaks a lot to what we've got with our salvage, with our salvage community. They have come together just incredibly. I keep saying it's like this brotherhood. You can see it. They are bringing all the experiences, not just from here in the Chesapeake, but from around the world, wherever they've been, and they're applying it here. Uh, together with the salvage community and the unified command, I think we're on the right course to be able to do this as quickly as possible. And as far as movement of equipment, I don't know. Did I answer your question? or? Oh, yeah, you got this. Now. Thank you. And so right now we're going through the assessment of, of how we can use Trade Point to be able to assist with uh, to assist with all these efforts. You know, we know that the priority is we've got to get the not just the channel cleared, but we've got to get the Port of Baltimore reopened, that it is such a unique asset, not just in the region, but frankly, it's a unique asset to this country. So getting it reopened is a priority, but we also know that we are going to, uh, going to look to and explore leveraging elements such as Trade Point to be able to get this flow of commerce going. I'd say the, the, the first, the investigation is still ongoing. Uh, the, the thing that we know is that the work that the first responders did, the work that the, uh, that the MTA officers did uh, in terms of being able to move quickly as soon as they heard the information about the Mayday, uh, it undoubtedly saved lives. Uh, the ability to stop flow of, of traffic, um, to make sure that there were no additional cars that are going to end up on the bridge. And in addition to that, uh, it did not just uh, support those and save those who did not end and make it on the bridge, but also anyone who would have come after it, even after the collapse. Uh, the investigation is still ongoing as to, uh, as to the communication flow that was taking place with the, uh, uh, with the people who were working on the ground, but, um, who were working on the, on the bridge. But again, our, our debt of gratitude to these, uh, to these first responders is, is boundless. To the, to the families, I would, uh, I would continue to say that you have an entire state and country and world who's, who are lifting you up in prayer. Uh, we know, and I indicated that our first priority was making sure that we can help to bring a sense of closure to these families, um, that they are living a nightmare right now. One that, um, that sits with me, one that sits with each and every one of us, and, um, and we know that, uh, that the priority that we have is making sure that those families feel supported and that they can have a sense of closure. Well, the, the, the fact that we're, we're here at Trade Point and we're able to, uh, uh, to look up and, see, uh, and, and see, see, see these cranes, I mean, it's showing that, that we're already moving and putting things in place to make this happen. Uh, I think it is important to recognize that, that ever since the wee hours of the morning when this first happened, this work has not stopped. People have been working uh, in multiple different ways in order, to, uh, in order to get us to the point that, uh, that we we're having momentum in progress, and that is going to continue to be the case. We are not going to stop. We are not going to stop working. This team is not going to stop working together in order to get to our final completion. So, um, so the, uh, the, the thing I, I would say is that the work pace and the fact that people just have not have worked, have worked consistently on creating progress results and getting us to a sense of completion, accomplishing our four goals, that has not stopped and it's not going to. Uh, 
Oh, Peter with Politico. Um, in the 1980s, a similar kind of uh, a bridge collapse happened in Florida. After that, federal researchers recommended that a warning system for bridges in case of collapse was urgently needed. I'm wondering if MDOT has ever considered a railroad style uh, warning system for bridges in case of collapse, or is that something you would consider moving forward? Well, I, I can tell you that uh, we are and will explore any and all options because there's nothing that I will not do to make sure that the people of my state are safe. Uh, you know, when you think about what's happening here, there is a there there is an unprecedented uh, a measure of unprecedented nature of what we're talking about. We were actually speaking when we were out with the Coast Guard earlier, uh, speaking with the with the Coast Guard commandant, and saying that uh, that you know we have Tampa and Minneapolis and the and the, and the bridge collapse in in uh, in, in, in Minnesota. Uh, the uniqueness of what we're seeing here, uh, where you not only have a a massive vessel uh, that is then stuck but then you also have a bridge that has collapsed on top of it and all the other factors makes this a uh, makes this a, a, a remarkably complicated situation so we know there are going to be there are lessons learned that we've seen from other tragedies that we will incorporate into our thinking going forward there will be lessons learned that we'll take from what happened here with uh with the with the key bridge that we know that we'll incorporate how we're talking about our work going forward and that will just be uh, our ability to be able to continue to assess and make better is going to be something that's going to be consistent. So that's not something that's been contemplated before by MDOT? Uh, do, do you want to speak about MDOT? Um, that was uh, 45 years ago. So we're actually researching to see what was done at that time. Um, and as we get to that information, we'll share it. Post. Um, I, I'm wondering what percentage of port cargo shuttered from the bridge collapse can be handled here at Trade Port Atlantic, and do you have any plans to expand the capacity here? And if so, how soon will these public resources be deployed to expand capacity? I, I can take it first if you. I can take it first if you want to. Yeah. Uh, well, so I think part of the thing we're doing right now is assessing uh, what percentage and, and capacity. You know, there is a there there is a uniqueness about uh, about the Port of Baltimore, um, both you know size, capacity of vehicles. I think you can just look at simply at the dolly to get an example of the size and the enormity of the kind of vessels uh, that. That, um, that we can take on in the Port of Baltimore. So I think what we're doing right now is doing a continued assessment of, of, what, type of what type of cargo can be taken in places like Trade Point and how can that serve as not just a, not just a, a, a stopgap, but a potentially an additional supplemental. And so we are consistently looking at different options of continuing to increase capacity uh, for, here, uh, for, for here and other locations as well. In terms of the, um, what's happening here right now with, with the materials, we're working with, um, with the group here, and they will do some paving and things like that to support that. In terms of the, the overall business model, we're looking at things, for instance, we do a lot of the processing, processing of vehicles that come to this port. So right now, we're getting cars in other ports and bring them here for processing. So again, we're going to keep working the model, the business model, to see how we can keep business here and keep labor employed. Last question. Chris Peterson, ABC News. Um, there's been media reports that uh, crews may have detected a large vehicle underwater in the wreckage. Is that the case? And additionally, um, you have the Chesapeake 1000 behind you. Uh, can you confirm that it's the largest crane on the East Coast? And is it currently in use? And if not, when will it be in use? And how will it be used? In terms of um, anything uh, that, that's been discovered, um, it, it's way too early. I mean, the people, are, you know, we have divers down there. Um, as has been talked about, they're maybe seeing a foot to two feet in front of them. So as we start the, the removal of some of those materials, that will become clearer to us, and we'll deal with that issue, and we'll deal with those souls that are down there as we find them. In terms of, um, I'm sorry, the second part of your question? Well, I mean, well, well, just to be clear, you talked about things that hasn't been detected or hasn't not been detected? There, there's been different things been detected, but until you get down there and start to remove things to see what you really have, that's a, that, that's a different exercise.
my understanding is the largest that was available that we could get down here as quickly as we could get it down here and it will be made available as soon as the engineering and the safety aspects of starting that process begin uh, then that is when it will begin